Namaskaromi. So now that we've got this sort of overview of the four kinds of words in Sanskrit, let's dig in a little deeper into how the nominals, nouns, and adjectives, and pronouns are conceptualized and formed in Sanskrit. Uh, these are all classified together by again by grammarians using the term subanta. Literally, this means the words that have a special ending that's called the sup. Uh, the, the sup is a generic term for the various case endings that all nouns, adjectives, and pronouns are going to have. Uh, our goal is going to be not to learn every single form of uh, all the case endings by heart, but we want to know the meanings of each case uh, by heart, and then to be able to memorize at least a handful of paradigms for the basic nouns, the basic pronouns, and then adjectives as well. Uh, not exhaustive, but a, a solid start. Now to start with, let's return to the only difference that we know between nouns and adjectives, namas and visheshanas in Sanskrit. Every noun has a gender, and it's one of three genders, right? Three lingas, masculine, feminine, neuter. Uh, adjectives don't have a gender by themselves, and instead they're going to assimilate. They're going to take on the gender of whatever noun they're modifying in the sentence. Aside from that, uh, the vast majority of adjectives are going to function just like nouns in a sentence. They get declined according to case and number, and but this case and number will match the nouns uh, that they're going with. The Sanskrit term for the three genders again is punlinga, strilinga, and napunsaka linga. Pum is an old Vedic word actually meaning masculinity. Stri is the word for woman. Uh, literally, this means then masculine marker and feminine marker. The third is the na pumsaka linga, the not masculine marker. Uh, grammatical gender or linga is often is going to correlate with biological gender when it comes to gendered entities like humans or tigers or cats and dogs and so on. But the thing is, is that every noun is going to have a gender no matter what that noun is, even rocks and water and dirt. And you just have to learn the gender alongside learning what the word means. So gajaha means elephant, it's masculine. A female elephant would be gaja or gaji. Vyagraha is a male tiger in Sanskrit. Female tiger would be vyagri. Uh, there's other words that are arbitrary. Pustakam is neuter, as is netram, I. Odanam, rice, jalam, water, rataha, chariot, is masculine, uh, ankani, the pen, is feminine. Now, the gender of the word doesn't have to correlate with the gender of the person or being either. Usually it does, but not always. So, the standard word for wife, bharya, that's a feminine noun. But there's also a neuter word for wife, galatram. And then there's also the word daraha which also means wife, and which, interestingly enough, is both masculine and it's also plural. Uh, in the same way, we have the masculine word devaha, meaning god, a male god. Uh, the feminine devi would mean a female goddess. But we also have the feminine word, uh, strilinga word, devata, which means a god or a deity, a divinity, and it can refer either to male or female gods. So for, no for nouns, we'll need to remember the gender of the noun along with the word itself, uh, while adjectives, on the other hand, can take any gender. In order to help us remember the connection between gender and nouns, we'll generally learn words in what's called the nominative singular form, which gives away the gender. So Ramaha is masculine, Sita is feminine, Pustakam is neuter. Aha, um, Ah, these endings are going to help us remember masculine, neuter, feminine. Pullinga, napunsaka linga, stri linga. So let's turn to two other dimensions now of nouns and adjectives, the number and the case. Uh, like we mentioned before, Sanskrit is going to be just a little bit more complicated than any other language you've ever learned or possibly can learn. Three genders instead of two, but now we also have three numbers instead of two. Most languages will have singular, plural, and uh, singular and plural numbers, of course. Sanskrit will also have the dual, meaning uh, if exactly two people, two entities are involved in the action, then the nouns are going to be declined differently than if there's three or more 
individuals involved. So if your two ears are hearing, it takes the dual. If your two feet are aching, it's gonna take the dual. If your two sisters are sleeping in the next room, yes, that also means you have to use the dual. Uh, in Sanskrit, the number, this number is called vachana. The three numbers are called eka vachana, dvi vachana, and bahu vachana. Eka means one, dvi means two, bahu means many. So if you said gajaha, you're talking about one elephant, eka vachana. Gajau, dvi vachana, would mean two elephants, and gajaha, three or more elephants. For neuter words, netram would mean one eye, netre is two eyes, Netrani means three or more eyes. Strilinga, the feminine, mala would mean one necklace. Male would mean two necklaces. Malaha is three or more necklaces. So, so far, so good, right? Uh, but we're not done yet. Just getting started. Uh, in fact, the hardest part of learning nouns is coming up, which is that each noun will have seven, up to seven distinct relationships to other words in the sentence. And these relationships are going to be inflected through specific endings or suffixes that are attached to the stem of that noun. In English, these relationships either are not expressed, you just have to know them, or they're done through prepositional phrases like from the box or to the car or of the horse. In Sanskrit, though, the relationships are going to be embedded, attached right onto the words themselves as endings. This gives the language a tremendous amount of power and a tremendous amount of precision because you can have greater clarity of meaning and then also flexibility of that word order. Uh, these endings are organized into seven different cases or vibhaktis, uh, as well as one additional pseudo quasi case called the sambodhana or the vocative. Um, the, from the grammarian's point of view, these vibhaktis, these cases, they generally are referred to only by their number. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Well, we're going to do that. We'll also use the English linguistic terms uh, that refer to the seven cases that tell you how they work. The first is the prathama, the nominative. Uh, and it's used when the noun is the subject of the sentence. It's the agent. This noun is going to be the agent of the action of whatever actively conjugated verb you'll find in the sentence. When we say, gajaha trunam khadati, the elephant eats grass. Gajaha is in our prathama vibhakti, the nominative case. It's the elephant who's doing the grass eating. The second case is the dvitiya vibhakti, the accusative case. This is used when the noun is going to be the direct object of the action of the verb, the thing that the action is being done to. In our same sentence, gajaha trunam khadati, the strunam, the grass, is expressed in the second case, in the dvitiya vibhakti, the accusative. Our third case is the tritiya vibhakti, the instrumental case. This is used when the noun uh, is the instrument by means of which, with which, uh, the action of the verb is being done. Ramaha hastena odanam khadati. What this would mean, Rama is eating rice with his hand. Khadati is our active verb. Ramaha is the is in the nominative case he's in the nominative odanam is the second case the accusative and hastena is in the third case the instrumental meaning uh, with his hand hasta means hand and the ending ena is our instrumental singular ending the fourth case is the chaturthi vibhakti the dative uh, this is used to indicate the indirect object of a verb the noun to which for which for sake of which any action is being done. So if we say Ramaha Vanaraya Odanam Dadati, Dadati is the verb now, it means Rama gives the rice to the monkey. Dadati is the verb, Odanam is the direct object and it's in the accusative. Ramaha is in our nominative, our Prathama. Uh, and finally, Vanaraya to the monkey is now in our dative case, the Chaturthi Vibhakti. The Panchami, the fifth case, is known as the ablative. This is used to refer to the cause of any action, the source of an action. In the case of verbs of motion, where uh, the person is coming from, uh, that kind of thing. So if I say, Ramaha vanat agachati, Rama is coming from the forest. Vanat is in our fifth case, in Panjami Vibhakti, the ablative. 
the sixth case, the shashti vibhakti, the genitive, is used for possessives uh, of or belonging to X. So basically like an apostrophe S in English. If we had Sita Ramasya Odanam Khadati, Sita is eating Rama's rice. Here Ramasya is in our sixth case in our genitive, the Shashti Vibhakti. Finally, we have the Saptami Vibhakti, the seventh case known as the locative in English. Like the name locative indicates, it's going to be a, 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 a location in, on, with reference to, with regard to. So if we said Simhaha, Vane Vasati, the lion lives in the forest. Vane, here is in the seventh case, the Saptami, the locative. If these seven vibhaktis aren't enough for you, there's one more nominal inflection that you have to learn. It's not considered a full-fledged case ending or vibhakti in its own right. Uh, it's called, it, this is the vocative or sambodhana in Sanskrit, and it's used when you want to directly hail or call out to a noun uh, outside of the sentence. It's, uh, it's ex going to be exactly the same as the first case, except for in the nominative where it'll have a different singular ending. So if you say, he si te, Kim Kadasi, you're saying, Hey Sita, what are you eating? Sita is the sambodhana, the vocative of Sita. Similarly, Hey Rama, Kim Kadasi, Hey Rama, what are you eating? Uh, putting all of these seven cases plus the sambodhana together, uh, combining them all also with our three numbers, singular, dual, plural, uh, what we're left with is what we call a paradigm, a chart uh, with eight rows now and three columns, so 24 different uh, forms. They're going to be dif different depending on the letter that each stem, noun stem ends with and also the gender of the noun. Memorizing these paradigms is what's going to turn Sanskrit learning into a bit of a grind. It also makes it highly useful for training your mind, your mental faculties to become sharper, clearer, calmer, less chaotic. So I'd urge you to every day practice your paradigms during your morning routines, even part of a paradigm. When you're getting ready for bed, when you're walking to the coffee shop, when you're waiting in line, when you're going to work, to school, every time you're alone in your thoughts, uh, let the paradigms course through your mind and it'll have a cleansing effect in a way, a rejuvenating effect uh, for your mind that always has to stress out about everything. So let's pause here, and in our next segment, uh, let's run through your first paradigms for three auspicious nouns that students in South Asia have traditionally started their studies with for centuries. First, the god, king, prince, Lord Rama, his wife Sita, who's a goddess in her own right, and the word for book, Pustakam. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Punarmilamaha, Namiladaha.